amazing watching the crowds of people line up and taking her photos. Everyone's just so excited and happy to see her. If you hear a lot of real enthusiasm and high-pitched ooh and ah, then you say to whoever you're with, oh gosh, come on, she must be out. Because, I mean, people don't just passively look at Fiona. They are very, very excited. It sounds like you're at some sort of a rock concert where <laughs> some major celebrity has finally stepped onto stage. It's like she'll peek her head out and you can tell the exact moment when the public has a line of sight to see her because it's just an eruption of cheering and, and some, some people literally cry. I've seen people like get there and have like a spiritual moment when they see Fiona for the first time. But she's just had such an impact in so many people's lives and they feel like they know her so intimately and then it's just like a celebrity like finally getting to see them in person and be like, oh my God, they're real. This year I've traveled all over the world. Went to West Africa, Central Africa, Central America to really remote places to watch wildlife. There is not a place I have been that if somebody sees the, my zoo had the zoo logo or hears them from the zoo, that someone doesn't ask me all about Fiona in the middle of nowhere. I mean, people know about her. She, she's probably the most famous animal in the world right now. So we knew when we opened Hippo Cove and when we had a male and female hippo together that we would most likely have a baby hippo eight months from that time or thereabouts. We didn't know exactly um, if we, when we'd have a calf, but we knew we were going to have one. So we concluded she was pregnant by two things. One, um, Henry's interest in her like just stopped. I mean, he still wanted to be near her, but there wasn't any breeding interest. So from that point, we estimated a late March or April calf. And then um, crew decided they wanted to try to ultrasound a hippo, which no one had done before. And it worked, and they were able to give us a more accurate uh, development timeline. We just basically taught her a really simple lean-in behavior. We bring her into the chute. We ask her to lean this side of her body into the protective barrier so that we can reach safely underneath there. And she's so smart, she picked it up like that. And then since she got pregnant so quickly, <laughs> We weren't sure at what point we would able, be able to see a fetus if we were going to. Again, this was another one of these areas where there wasn't a road map already written. There wasn't a guide or a manual, so we weren't really sure what it would look like when we saw it. But then one magical day, we were kind of exploring and looking at the static on the screen, and then just out of nowhere, clear as day, this tiny little spine and rib cage showed up. And then we kind of moved a little bit, and we saw this tiny little flickering heartbeat. And we're like, oh, my God, it's a heartbeat. And we all started screaming and like kind of cheering, like, baby, you're pregnant. And we had our, you know, we had our assumptions leading up to it again, and we were all fairly certain that she was pregnant. But then, like, seeing it and seeing that little heartbeat and, and also knowing, like, we just made history. Like, no one has ever done this before. This is the first time somebody has seen a baby hippo in utero and got images of it. That was a really cool, I have goosebumps right now just talking about it. That was such a cool day. And so we anticipated a birth and we thought, well, this is just going to go along smooth. Well, as, as everyone knows, two months early, through watching on remote TVs, we determined, oh my gosh, she's given birth to a very young animal, and that's never happened before, to um, raise a premature hippo like that. We saw signs starting at 10 a.m. on January 23rd. And she did not get out of that water for 12 hours, and she stayed in there doing the same thing. The keepers stayed till late that evening, and then I took over watching on the cameras overnight from home. And at about 3 in the morning, she uh, was on land, which is another you know, blessing that allowed for Fiona to be here. And she stood up, and out came Fiona. Um, and she was alive, which was really surprising. Um, and BB seemed fine, and we... That was the last thing we saw before we rushed in to uh, help in person. She's trying to stay, she's trying, she's moving at least with purpose from the moment she's born. Um, and she gets weak really quickly. And BB was very calm and she wasn't aggressive towards us, which can sometimes happen with new moms. Um, and she was paying her some attention, but um, couldn't really help her very much. Um, so we watched her for a little bit. And then we decided we were going to try to give her better traction than standing on concrete. Um, so we moved BB over uh, just by offering her some food. Good old BB, she loves her food. Um, and and we went in, and I picked up Fiona, and Dan laid down 
all the straw in there to cover the whole stall, a nice thick layer of straw, which would also help keep the calf warm. And we put her back right in the center, propped her up in the position that would help her stand up, and then let Bibi back over to be with her. Um, but the, at that, after that, at that point, she was very warm still to the touch and everything, and she was alert. Her eyes were open, and she was looking around. But um, she very quickly got more and more weak, and we saw less and less movement with purpose from her. Um, and then the veterinarian arrived, and so we decided to move her, move Bibi over again, and get a better look at Fiona. Once it was apparent that okay, this baby can't nurse on her own. We have to come up with a formula. There isn't a pre-made hippo mix. There's not like a powdered mix that you just add water to and it's perfect. Um, so somebody said, well, do you think she'll let us milk her? Could we try? And we're like, yeah, we can certainly try. And just like with every ultrasound, we were like, is this her? Can we, is it okay if we do this back here? And uh, she was like, yeah, that's fine. Again, keep the food coming. And the, it's pretty cool to say the first animal I've ever milked was a hippo. As long as BB was willing, we were trying to milk her three times a day. Um, I think being able to get that milk from BB let us know what hippo milk is made of and what the composition of fats and proteins and everything is in it. We were able to give her um, a decent amount of it in each feeding her first 10 days of life, which was helpful um, for getting immunity passed and just in general I think was helpful to keep her healthy. But we got enough that we sent some to Smithsonian's repository and they analyzed it for us and they told us the exact contents of like the fat, the protein, the carbs, the sugars, everything. So then having that information, knowing what BB's milk looked like, we were able to tailor make our milk to try and match it as closely as we could. So that was a huge leg up. And then also we had milk that we could add to the formula that we were giving Fiona. So all of that good stuff that happens in that colostrum, that first milk that's so important for babies to have right after they're born. Fiona did get some of that, and that wouldn't have happened otherwise. That she would have not had any of those good antibodies, all that important stuff, um, all just kind of serendipitously because we had already done the ultrasound behavior. So that worked out really, really well. We never could have <laughs> planned it or, or even imagined it that way. But again, there's so many little twists and turns in Fiona's story that we're just like, man, that was lucky. And we needed it because Fiona's start in life was really unlucky. So it's nice that it balanced out here and there. We were really nervous. I mean, early on, this hadn't been done before. We didn't know what to put in the milk. We weren't sure we could even pull this off. And a real heartening part of that story is everybody refused to give up. Our animal health team, the Dawn Strasser and the others that are great at Neonate Care, uh, Fiona's direct zookeepers that know her the best and know the parents the best. I mean, there's no way they were gonna give up. And that really was the early energy that drove this.